Howdy folks, I'm Pete Ellsworth. Now I don't know whether I can be considered an old timer, but I'm about the same age as a bunch of the old timers were. My great grandfather, Edmund Ellsworth, he was one of the first settlers in this area. Two of his sons, Frank and Abner, married two sisters of the Merrill family who was also early settlers here. Frank, he married Edna. Abner married Betty Ann, who was my grandparents. The Ellsworth families were very close associated with cattle and horses all of their lives. My father and uncle owned a permit on the Sitgreaves National Forest, which I later acquired, but I have been associated with horses and cattle most of my life. In the year of 1943, about the Second World War time, Ranger Tucker at the Lakeside Ranger Station indicated that uh, he would uh, go and together all of the trespass horses on the Sitgrays Forest from the reservation fence south of Pine Top down as far as the Shones Dam just south of Taylor. I'd asked Mr. Tucker if I might go on this roundup, and he told me that I could. He said, uh, you'll have to come into the office and fill out some papers. While I was sitting in his office across the desk from Mr. Tucker filling out these papers, he said, uh, Pete, how old are you? And I said, I'm 15. I'll never forget how he laid his pen down and reached over and picked up his pipe. He cleaned the ashes out of his pipe and reached over, filled his pipe with new tobacco and pushed it in, lit his pipe and took a couple of puffs. He said, Pete, we have a ruling that I cannot hire anybody under 16 years of age. He laid his pipe down and reached over and picked up his pen and without looking up he said, uh, Pete, how old are you? I said, I'm 16. I'll never forget how he picked up his pen and finished fi uh, filling out those papers and how happy I was at that time to know that I was going to be able to go on this horse roundup. We. Uh, started gathering horses in the vicinity of what is uh, Pine Top Country Club and White Mountain Country Club. There was no buildings of any kind from Pine Top clear to the reservation line south of Pine Top. We were camped over at Thompson Spring just east of Pine Top. And after several days of riding and moving camp down east of Lakeside and on down, we finally ended up right here in this area where I am now sitting. And this set of old corrals that is right behind me is the corrals where we corral this bunch of trespass horses and where we took care of them until the people that uh, come to get their horses and claim them. This was the home of Sholo's first ranger station. To the west of the corrals, there were granaries, saddle sheds, and a red barn. And to the east was a small house. The ranger station was built in 1908, about two miles north of Sholo, across Sholo Creek. Clark Owens became the ranger in 1915. He and his wife, Linny Ellsworth Owens, and seven children had lived in the two-bedroom house until 1920. During the summer months, Clark's responsibilities required him to be at the station continually, including Sundays. At any time, he might receive a phone call notifying him of a forest fire. If there was a fire, he had to get a crew of men and all the necessary supplies to fight it. His son, Wayne Owens, explains. When he would get notice of the fire, which was by phone, 
he would have to gather crews and equipment and supplies to fight the forest fires. Inasmuch as the, the information of these fires was by telephone, my father would patrol the telephone lines a horseback and make repairs if necessary. It was Clark Owen's job to survey boundary lines, make maps, and issue forest grazing permits to various cattle and sheep owners in the area. When winter came and there was no fire danger, the family moved into town so the children could attend school. Clark and his family left Sholo to live in the Gila Valley around 1920. Sometime after that, Ranger Leif Karchner and his wife Alice took the responsibility of the ranger station. At the time that the family had lived there, the house was surrounded by a picket fence and shade trees. Lilac bushes grew at the gate, and iris plants lined the walk. A pump on the creek provided water for household and domestic animal needs. Rocks formed steps that allowed a wagon or buggy to pull alongside so that passenger or driver could conveniently step out and down the steps to a walkway that led to the house. The ranger and his family were host to numerous travelers. When the Sholo and Lakeside District were consolidated with headquarters in Lakeside, the Sholo station was no longer needed. In the early 1940s, Slim Whipple, with the help of family and friends, used logs to jack up the old house. It was loaded on a low trailer and hauled into town by truck. The endeavor was no easy task. The road they used at the time went east from the location of the ranger station and came into town from the east. Whipple intended to make the house his family home. His property was at the south end of town, about a block south of Hewning Street, on the west side of White Mountain Road. Travelers coming into Sholo from the northern towns, typically Taylor, Snowflake, or Holbrook, usually came by horseback, wagon, or buggy. Mail rigs and freighters also frequented the road as they brought heavy wagons from Holbrook to stores in Sholo or the army post of Fort Apache. The road passed the ranger station then rounded a slight bend and crossed Sholo Creek over a bridge made of logs and supported by rock. Here can be seen all the remains of the bridge which slowly decayed and was finally washed away, probably in the flood of 1941. Sholo Lake Dam had not been built then, and the creek ran deeper and faster. After crossing the creek and traveling south approximately a mile, the road entered Sholo and began a zigzag pattern through town. This road would be the first graded road in Sholo. During the winter, horses were hitched to a V-shaped mechanism which was pulled along the roads to clear the snow. The first homes to be seen as the road turned east were those of Jesse Brady and Charles Reedhead. Brady's home was sold to James Stratton. These are two of the Stratton girls and a friend by the remodeled Brady home. In the background is the Reedhead home. Charles Reedhead's home was built about 1917. The brick for the home came from Philemon Merrill's brick kiln that was located south of town on the Ellsworth Ranch. Cattle belonging to the Reedheads were moved west to the corrals on what is now Sholo's Main Street. Their home can be seen above the cattle, and Roy Jacobson's big barn is on the left. Seen here are one of Sholo's few wells. The Reedhead house is to the right, and Jacobson's barn is behind. The road turning south at Roy Jacobson's big barn went for a block, passing the beautiful brick home of Abner Ellsworth, built about the same time as the Reedhead home. Behind the horse-drawn covered wagon is the house. Trees were along the road. Lilac bushes, roses, and other flowers lined a path to the house. Here are Betsy and Abner Ellsworth in front of their home. The now deteriorated house still stands on 8th Street just south of the Deuce of Clubs. The road now turned east to Harvest Ellsworth's home the present location of Citizens Utilities and Communications on the corner of Hall and 9th Street. Before the road turned south again, Sholo's first church building, situated on a small hill, caught the eye. Construction began in 1909. The block building was intended to be a school. The townsfolk were using Cooley's White House for their church services. When it burned, 
The building in progress was completed and used as both church and school. It was the social gathering place for Sholo. Weddings, plays, dances, grade school graduations, operettas, movies, and all kinds of parties and political meetings were held there. Also to the south and to the right was the saloon and gas station belonging to Don McNeil. At the end of the block was the home of Eve and Nell Mills. At the time, the telegraph line from Holbrook crossed this property and continued south to Fort Apache. Just south of the Mills property could be seen the homes of Bill Nicholas and his father, Frank Nicholas, a German immigrant. To the west, at the top of the hill, resided a four-room school built in 1919. Until that school was built, the children were taught in various places. Looking east from the schoolhouse hill was a path that crossed an irrigation ditch to what is now Hewning Street. To the left was the barn and home of Bill Oliver, the brick home of J.C. Owens, and at the far end, the Willard Whipple home. To the right, though not seen, was the home of Dan and Sarah Mills. Sholo did have a high school class in 1924 when Lena Wright taught the ninth grade. Some students went to Lakeside to high school. But for years after that, those desiring higher education attended the Snowflake Academy and were invited to live with families in that community. The Academy building burned shortly after it was built on Thanksgiving night, 1910. The glow of the fire could be seen in Shola, but the people didn't know what was burning until the word had reached them the following day. The building was left in ruin, but shortly thereafter, another building was built and still is in use as part of the Snowflake High School campus. Years later, students were bused to the Snowflake High School. Buses made this trip once a day until Sholo had its own high school, with its first four-year class graduating in 1976. Now the road turned east, and on the left was the two-story brick home of James Clark Owens, his blacksmith shop, and two barns where townsfolk gathered for celebrations. Earlier, about 1903 to 1911, school, church meetings, and funeral services were also held in the barn. May Day was one of the highlights of the year, with picnics, games, and competitions, such as leg wrestling. Across the street, south of J.C. Owen's place, was one of the oldest buildings in town, part of the Cooley Hewning Ranch, and home of John Fish. The Fish home later became the home of the Stock family. A couple of blocks east was the Arizona Cooperative Mercantile Store, which began operation in 1903. James Clark Owens and his son Clark managed the store for a time. Later, Charles Savage and William Beck purchased and operated the store until sometime in the early 1920s. I am Joe Wolford. My parents, George and Lily Wolford, took over the Savage Beck store in the 1923s, and they changed the name to the Sholo Cash store. From 1923 until the Depression years of the 30s, what was now the Sholo Cash store supplied the town with almost anything it needed in gasoline, groceries, staples, sundries, household items, or hardware. The store also housed the telephone office in one corner and the post office in another. One of the windows in the front of the store displayed men's and women's shoes, boots, and hats. Some of the women's hats were made by my grandmother, Clara Wolford. This picture shows the Penrod children wearing hats made by my grandmother. An unusual tenant of the Sholo Cash store was a young bear. The bear was kept on the chain where wary customers bought him a red soda pop and watched as he took the bottle in his paws, tipped it up, and drank it just as he had seen the humans do it. This old building still stands on the corner of 11th Street in Hewning. North, across the street from the store, was the Wolford home. As the road continued east, you could see the Hewning bunkhouse, which was the home of the Willard Whipple family. North of the Willards' home was that of his brother, Edson. 
It was Edson who began digging in the ancient ruin, one of many that existed in the area. He gained a sizable collection of artifacts. In the early 1920s, Dr. A. E. Douglas of the University of Arizona undertook a project to date the tree rings of ancient timbers unearthed in the southwestern ruins. As he excavated the Sholo ruin, a timber was unearthed which bridged a gap in his research. Shown here is the excavation that took place. From left to right was the Willard Whipple home, the Penrod Hotel, a storage shed, the Ellsworth store, and home of Edson Whipple. I am Chet Adams. My grandfather is George M. Adams. <clears throat> he was one of the early pioneers here in the Sholo area. One of Sholo's most famous photographs of Corydon Cooley's White House shows him as he returned from a successful hunt. Looking over the fields and pastures and across the creek to the east was the beautiful home that Henry Huning built. George Adams bought it in 1903. Fred Adams wrote about his parents. Father and mother had a government forage station. They took care of the soldiers as they traveled from Fort Apache to Holbrook and returned. They fed and bedded the officers and at times their wives were with them. We had a barn to shelter the horses and mules used to transport them. The soldiers slept in a comfortable log cabin and were fed in our home. At times the cavalry came. How busy we were feeding animals and men. Frank Adams used his threshing machine to harvest grain, and using a wagon drawn by a team of horses, he hauled it to his own or his neighbor's barn. My name is Wendell Whipple, and those people call me Winky, which I'm known more by than my real name. And I've spent many hours down along this creek here, from one end to the other of it. We've spent time here, we've gone swimming a lot, and uh, spent many hours up and down it here as, with other boys and raised in our area here. And we've fished, fished from the banks of it. Up here in these trees, you could get along the edge and fish all the way up and down the creek here. This uh, area was not only used, water wasn't depended on here for the community at one time and for the livestock and for irrigation purposes, many uses of it here. And this creek has been a vital part of Sholo. And before it was a lot deeper than before it, uh, Sholo Lake Dam was put in. And when we come down here swimming, this rock right out here in the middle of this creek was one of our favorite spots to get on there and sit around and sit in the sun. And there was one thing about it here at that time why you could go skinny dipping here and there wasn't too much anybody ever see once in a while your clothes, somebody take your pants down the creek for you or off out in the field where you had to go get them, but that was just part of life here then. But there's been a lot of fond memories of this creek here. As, it, as I grew up here in my life, we were, this creek was used for many things. Right below here, just a little ways why there's a lot of the older kids in this community that were baptized in this creek. That was the old baptism area that they had. And that's when they went, they had all, those that had birthdays in the fall of the year, winter time, we had to wait till in the summertime to have that taken care of. Casting a hook from the bank with hopes of catching a fish or two, or launching a raft on the slow moving water as in Tom Sawyer fashion, were just some of the ways of passing a summer day. Others took advantage of the lush, cool vegetation, spread a blanket, and enjoyed a picnic. I'm more than ones. We're uh, standing in a place here now along Sholo Creek on the north side of Sholo. I'm uh, an old time resident here. Lived, uh, was born and raised here. I'm now 77 years old. I still enjoy this location. We had spent many a happy time in our boyhood in this location along the creek. This was our pasture where we kept our work horses and our riding horses and our milk cows as well as having the farms on each side of the creek here. Many a 
good time was enjoyed here as were many working days spent down in this area. So there are happy memories. We are on, on the north side of Sholo. All This creek was had some mighty good swimming holes in it. Many of the people of town on hot summer days we would swim in the different holes up along the creek here right on up to the edge of the Sholo, even right where the bridge is across the Sholo Creek now. My brother Dwayne and I it was a hot summer day and we'd taken the taken salt to our cattle out in our pasture out east of town. We took sheep salt in a burlap bag out there and put in the, in the salt trough for the cattle out in the pasture. Well, we came back into town and came down into our field here and, and uh, it was pretty warm. We decided to freshen up a little bit so we tied our horses to some willows right here. It was a nice green ba grassy bank. We tied our riding horses to the willows here and stripped off completely, got in the creek, and that water was nice and cool and really refreshing. But up to the south of us here, there was a little round hole. Water made kind of a circle in that hole and it was a round hole and it was a little deeper, a little more fun swim, swimming there. So we swam on up to that little round hole and spent quite a bit of time splashing around and having our fun there. Decided it was time to get out and get back to our business. So we came back down here to our horses and ready to get out. Lo and behold, not a stitch of clothing. What had happened to our clothes? Well, we were in quite a predicament. We had two horses and we were naked. And all this area to the east of us here was covered with willows at that time. And uh, there was a bank right here, like a little, uh, kind of like it is now, and the pathway up it. And I ran up onto that bank and looked up the lane, our old cattle drive up here into town, where we took our milk cows and horses and all up through that lane to our barn that was situated in, located in town. And I got up on that bank and there were two girls hot footing it up the lane. They were pulling out. And boy, we, we knew where our clothes went then. So, what to do, what to do? Oh, we finally got a bright idea. We took the, the, she, the burlap bag off the back of the saddle and uh, got a couple of, of uh, cobble rock, knocked holes in the corners of the bag, and I pulled that bag up over me, and jumped on one of the horses, and I took off. But those gir girls saw me coming, and they, the, one of the girls' grandfather lived in a brick house. It was Charles Savage, a savage lived in a brick house where Highway 60 is now. And uh, they went, running up into that brick house. It was a two-story house, and they got up in the upper story, and they gave me the hee-haw as I went by on my saddle horse with just a burlap bag over me. And it seemed like all the people in town were out on that street that day, and so it turned out to be a good conversation piece for some time about me going through town with a burlap, in a burlap bag. When winter came, those who were lucky enough to own a pair of ice skates had great fun gliding up and down the frozen creek. Another advantage of the creek was that when it was frozen, chunks of ice were cut and hauled into sheds. There they were stacked and covered with sawdust to await the hot summer months when it would provide the community with blocks of ice for making ice cream, cooling their drinks, and filling their ice boxes. Okay, we're standing now where the, I guess you'd call it a community orchard. It was about all the people in Sholo at that time owned own part of this orchard. Right where we're at now belonged to Bishop John L. Willis. The next one belonged to my grandfather, uh, Game Clark once. But all it was, it was the same orchard with just a fence line between the trees. It wasn't a, a large space between them because the trees all grew together. It was one large orchard by the, the, the old Huning orchard. 
and uh, the, there was Bishop Willis, my grandfather, uh, the Whipples, uh, uh, Lord Whipples, and the Frank Elders. They owned this orchard, and uh, it was a a great place to come and play hide and seek. And we had we had a lot of fun as kids playing in this orchard. As the road turned south again on the corner to the right was the Sholo Hotel, built by Clara Wolford and her sons in 1909. Clara fed travelers and rented rooms by the night or longer to teachers or surveyors. Since the Adams family no longer cared for the traveling officers or cavalry from Fort Apache, they now stopped at the hotel. Velma Smithson explains. Here is the pay escort going from Holbrook to Fort Apache with money to pay the soldiers. Mules packed the money. Clara sold the hotel in 1916 to my grandparents, Lyona and Marcina Penrod. Grandma wrote in her diary, we sold our home in Pine Top for $1,000. Our herd had increased to 42 head, worth $1,500. The $1,000, 42 head of cattle, and two saddle horses gave us a clear deed to the property of Claire Wolford. Grandma and Grandpa remodeled the house making it for their home and adding a small grocery store in the front. Across the street to the north of the Penrod home was the grocery store of Leroy Ellsworth. Frank Ellsworth and Sons had purchased the store from Willard Whipple. It was built in 1910. I was born in that house, and throughout my childhood, that meant so very much to me. Here we see what is now Hewning Street. On the left was an auto garage owned by George Wolford, with the Whipple Ellsworth store at the far end to the left of the Whipple home. On the right are warehouses, which included the ice house and livery stables. One of the warehouses was struck by lightning and burned. The Wolford Penrod home at the far right was surrounded by freshly washed clothes hung out to dry. Cars belonged to A.N. Cook and Wolford. The ditch carried irrigation water. The road continued a gradual turn southward past the John Oscar Reedhead home. That home was originally built by Merritt Staley and was one of the first homes, other than Corydon Cooley's, in the area. George Adams bought that home from Staley and added a second story. Adams later sold it to Reedhead. Setting close to the road was the log cabin home of Alonzo and Nellie Merrill. The couple was living in Adair at the time they built the house. When they moved to Sholo, the house came too. This is the Alonzo J. Merrill home, here. And in the back you can see his old log barn, the remnants of it, and the old corn crib it sits back over here, just the other side of these orchard trees. There were several families living on and around the Ellsworth Ranch, so the area became known as the Ellsworth Settlement. This was apart from Sholo at the time. A large building was erected about 1910 to serve as a church and a school. It stood on the west side, about midway in the valley, a few feet south of 1250 South White Mountain Road. This building was used as a school for the Ellsworth, Merrill, and other children until 1919 when they attended the new school on the hill in Sholo. The building originally had two windows on both the north and south side, and a front door that faced east. Fire destroyed most of the Witty and Blanche Ellsworth home. All that remained were the original logs. The log home was probably built by Moses Clough, who owned the ranch early in Sholo history. Clough sold the ranch to Edmund Ellsworth. Here is the Ellsworth Ranch as it was 75 years ago. Creeks flowed through the ranch. The old road could be seen at the top. And in later years, Highway 260 divided the ranch. Well, folks, this is part of the old original Ellsworth Ranch that is now my branch, and I hope that you have enjoyed this film up till now, 
and I'll just say goodbye to you.